Hi, everybody, and welcome to HU and Beyond. This week, our guest is Dr. Melanie Stegman. She is a HU faculty member, and she specializes in turn, turning biochemistry into fun video games. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Melanie. I did a, um, a PhD in biochemistry. I grew thousands of fruit flies, and then I mashed them up in a blender, and I studied their proteins, and I found cures to cancer. Well, you know, 20 years from now, it'll be a cure to cancer and maybe a cure to tuberculosis in some other generation. So that's what I did. And then I decided that it would be fun to make video games to teach all of you guys what I was doing in the lab. So I started making science video games, biochemistry video games. What I would like to tell you about today is all the different jobs that I need. I need people to do art for me. I need people to do programming for me. I need people to do the user interface design. I need people to study whether people are learning by playing my games. So there's people doing experiments on whether or not this game is actually teaching anything. And those people are called user experience researchers. They're also called education researchers. And there are artists who just draw two-dimensional graphics. There are artists that draw three-dimensional graphics. There are also artists that specialize in the user interface. And there's even someone called a technical artist, and they specialize in making sure that all that art, 2D, 3D, and everything else, makes sure that works in the game. So the programming says, when this collision happens, this is what it should look like. And a technical artist is the person making sure the art responds to the programming. So I could go on and on, but I wanted today to, you know, give you all a, an idea of the many different ways you can do science. When I was, when I was nine, I wanted to own an art store. I was going to be an artist. I was going to own an art store, and I would have all the art supplies. And so that was always what I wanted to do for reals. And then, and then my great grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease when I was ten. And I asked my mom, you know, what is Alzheimer's? And she said, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And I thought, well, what keeps everything balanced normally? You know, I mean, because Alzheimer's was really bad. She didn't know who we were. And so I started thinking that um, I really wanted to study those brain chemicals. I wanted to know how neurons worked. And it just went from there. I was always interested in in drawing things, a lot of biology is drawing. So a lot of biology is seeing something and then recording it. And a lot of times you need to draw what you see because there's no other way of recording it. Now we have cameras, but before then, before we had cameras, you really, if you saw, um, you saw a disease or uh, a bug that had, had grown two legs instead of four, you had to draw the details. And so biology and, and art are mixed from the very beginning. So it wasn't really a big difference to me. But then when I got to college, I wanted to study biochemistry and I got scared and I changed my major. And I majored in something, you know, political science because it was interesting. People were arguing. But I was really unhappy. I wanted to have majored in biochemistry and I did it. So when I got out of college, um, I started I started writing a comic strip about Amy and Amelie's, who is very curious and doesn't understand why she has to do everything a certain way. And um, for me, that was how I was going to make other people familiar with biochemistry so they would never be afraid of it like I had been. So I took a art class a night class in how to draw three-dimensional things, how to be a technical artist, basically, using, you know, it was 1995, so it was all vector art, which everyone listening to this has no idea what I'm talking about, because really old program, <laughs> really, really old interface. And there was a X, X, X axis and a Y axis, and there's also a Z axis going in and out of the screen. And you had to move two spheres, you know, the second day in class, we were supposed to move spheres close to each other. And it took me forever to figure out how to move them because there's all these buttons you have to press. And then um, and you have to rotate the whole thing and figuring out how to push the mouse button and the keys and the arrows. And 
And uh, finally, I was like, look, I've got them together. And the teacher was came over and said, no, look, and rotated it. So now on the Z axis, they were still really far apart. And I was so panicky. I was, I never went back to that class. I did not do the third class. Like moving two spheres together in three dimensional space was too hard. And you know what I decided? That I would get a PhD in biochemistry because that would be easier. <laughs> and it was, I was never ever in seven years a biochemistry PhD program in three years as a postdoc, never again as freaked out as that art class. Oh. <laughs> when I was in my postdoc, I started working on my comic book again. And someone heard, one of my friends heard me talking about that and said, hey, I heard about this video game that someone made. And a think tank in DC had made a video game. And I asked them if they wanted some help. And they said, we're looking for a manager of the project. And it never dawned on them that a person with 10 years biochemistry experience would want to make a video game. But there was. I moved to DC to work in a think tank 10 years after starting a PhD program. And there you go. How many games have I been a part of? Well, um, Immune Attack was the first game I came in touch with. That's available on my website, molecularjig.com. It's Immune Attack. I didn't design it, but that was the game that I saw the think tank had already made, and I went to work for them. Um, I uh, did a study of learning. So I, for three years, I did education research and user experience research, and I asked teachers to play the game in the classroom, and, and I had a bunch of questions for kids to answer, and I showed that kids learned molecular cell biology. I showed that they... Um, gained confidence with molecular cell biology. So Immune Attack was my first game. Then what I wanted to do was do design, research-based design. So research-based design is when you have done research, like I did on Immune Attack, and I say, hmm, students remember everything they need to find. If, if it's a requirement to find it to win, they remember what it is and, and what it's called. And no one believed this at the time in 2010. Everybody thought, oh, nobody remembers the name of a white blood cell. They're not going to remember it. it's a monocyte. They're not going to remember that this protein is called ICAM. But, I mean, everyone remembers names of things in their video games. No one calls, you know, their favorite character the blue guy, you know. They want to know if it's a monocyte or if it's a macrophage. Like, So, students remembered the protein names. Anyway... Because I knew that players remembered everything they had to use, I designed Immune Defense, I designed my game, to require that everybody to use more things. So it's a, it's a strategy game. And in a strategy game, you, you buy things and you add things to them. It's, it's much more complicated and I think it's more fun. So Immune Defense um, took advantage of what I learned. Okay, then, then I worked um, as a game developer, I took some online classes and learned how to code. And then I, I worked as a freelancer and I got hired. And I worked for one company that was making a product. Um, they used eye trackers and you would look at a dot on the screen and it would measure where your eye was. And so it's measuring the health of your eye. Because um, in, the, in the doctor's office, they'll, they'll put your finger and they'll say, trace my finger. And they're, they're watching whether your eye moves smoothly or not. If your muscles are jittery, there could be something wrong with your muscles. And so I, we were building that product. And that's similar to game design. It's all the same skills, programming-wise, but um, it wasn't a game, really. Um, then I worked for a learning game company. And we actually made a, not a learning game. But it was a, it's a mobile game called Rotera. It's on the App Store. You can get it right now. I had a lot of fun designing that game and playing it with my friends at the company. And then I'm working on a product now at Harrisburg University. It's an interactive book, basically. So a medical student and a pharmacy student both read the same book and they can text each other. They're really acting out the role of a medical, of a doctor and a pharmacist talking about a patient. And it helps them realize, oh, I'm the doctor. This is what I can see about the patient. 
I'm the pharmacist. This is what I can see about the pharmacist, about the, about the patient, and, and let them realize they don't have access to the same information and that they, and they have different um, specialties, you know, different kind of knowledge about medicine. And on the side, because I'm crazy indie game developer, I have about four different games that I'm making up on my own and playing with on my own. And they're on my website, molecularjig.com. One of them is a VR game, a cardboard VR game. It's like dodge car game. The proteins are all moving around on the surface of the cell and you have to try to avoid them and find a path in between them all. And eventually you find a giant E. coli bacteria. <coughs> and you have to shoot it with your nano laser. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's not released yet. Um, I've been designing it and getting my friends to develop it for me and I'm looking for an artist. So, yeah, I've got one game you can download right now and play. One game that I researched and about five games that are prototypes. Well, I mean, if you like it enough to consider going to grad school, then then you can definitely do well enough to go into grad school. Like, if you like being in the lab, and um, it, it's kind of hard to explain because being in college lab is really kind of hard. They give you, uh, you have to start at the, at the same time and end with everybody else and there's not enough time. Um, they give you material and if you make a mistake, you know, so like college lab is very stressful. But if you like that at all, then you're gonna love grad school because if you make a mistake, you can get more material and do it again. <laughs> and, and you learn something from your mistake. So you're gonna do it better the next time. And in college lab, you don't really have a chance for that. So if you liked college lab and if you did, like if you were the top half or the top 25% of the grades for the lab part of your lab class, then you probably could do grad school, could handle it. Now, the other question is, can you handle working by yourself in a lab? And, um, you know, if you're, if your boss, you're, you know, you have an advisor, if she comes in and says, you put 11% detergent in the solution and you should only put 10% solution. If you think to yourself, that's a dumb little detail, then you're not going to do well in, in a lab because you've just ruined the entire experiment. And that's a variable that you've introduced. And you shouldn't even bother doing that experiment. You've ruined it. So if if you're not really care about those details, um, here's the thing. If you're interested in biochemistry, you can study cells and never go in a lab. You can study cells by modeling them on a computer. You collaborate with people who are in labs and you might, you might collaborate with hundreds of people. They give you your data and you model a cell based on lots of data. You can model a cell under cancer conditions. You can model a cell that's starving. There's many, many different um, biochemical pathways that we don't understand yet. And so the model for starving cells doesn't include the cancer information because those cancer labs and that starving cell, those are, they're separate labs. And we, we don't have a model sophisticated enough to model a whole cell and all of its activities. So there's a lot of work being done on computers that's giving us new biochemical data. So bioinformatics, systems, systems biology, there's a lot of um, stuff you can do that if, uh, Mixing detergent is not your cup of tea. Um, the other thing is in biochemistry, if you don't want to kill animals, you don't have to. Like I worked in fruit fly labs and bacteria labs because I didn't want to kill mice. We kill a lot of mice um, in in labs. You know, we, you can't kill humans. So, you know, if you want to, you know, you want to, you're looking at life, you got to study something, but um, you, you don't have to. You can go to fly labs, micro labs, biochemistry, uh, you know, like viruses and things like that. So you can choose what you do and you can also choose how you study. You can do computers instead of wet lab. And you could also do, you know, like ecology. You could go out in the world and work in a field. You don't have to be in a lab. So you can look at all those things. And 
whenever you're interested in anything, whether whether it's a lab job or it's a you know working on a newspaper, whenever you're interested in anything, just call somebody or you know email them or write them a, a tw tweet them on Twitter or whatever any way you can. Write to them and say, <clears throat> um, you know, how do I get trained to do your job? Should I should I get a master's degree? Should I get a PhD? You know, should I major in journalism? Should I major in biology? Just ask for an informational interview. You know, tweet them and say, can I have an informational interview? I'd love to, I'd love to have your job someday. And they will love talking to you. And if they don't, find someone else who has the same job and tweet them. Because <laughs> um, that's how you get into grad school. You write to a professor and you say, I've read what you do. I like what you've done with the flies. I'm very interested in cancer. And I think this kind of experiment would be interesting. And then the lab is like, hey, someone's interested in our work. Let's talk to them. Oh. Um, the easiest thing to do is find a game jam. So game jam is just, you know, for this weekend, we're all going to make a game. And you join a team of people and you make a game. Um, in October, there was a game jam about COVID. And so like the National Academies of Science hosted indie, anybody who wanted to come and make games about COVID. And so there's 19 games that got made in two weeks about COVID that are out there that you can find. Um, and then what you do, is you join a team. So there's someone who can program, there's someone who can make the art, someone who can design the game levels, someone who can, um, I don't know, you know, design the game, whatever. You actually end up, you have very little time, so you can't do anything very complicated anyway. It's a really good way to get started. And um, you can you can hand draw things, and take a picture of them and stick them in the game. It's a really good way to find out if you like it. There's also, you can learn to code using Scratch. That works on an iPad or a Chromebook. Scratch is a really fun little language. It's a really good way to learn how to code. Lego Robotics is a really fun way to learn how to code. You know, if your high school has a team, you know, wander in there and say, can I see what the code is like? Can you show me what it, what do you write in there to tell the robot? You'd give it a, like, you write go left and then it goes left, you know, like, how do you tell the robot to go left? That's programming. <laughs> There's lots of different ways to get involved. Game jams are one. Look, Unity, Unity 3D is a game engine and they have a lot of videos to get you started and also um, International Game Developer Association, IGDA. That's a, that's a group of people who um, make games. Some of them, you know, are like me. They've got five games that are half done. <laughs> the, you know, I'm not rich. I'm, I'm not a big fancy game <laughs> developer. And so people like me are willing to talk. And there's a lot of us in the IGDA. I'm 50 years old right now. Like, you know, 10 years from now, I'm 60 years old. I don't even know if your audience understands what retirement is, <laughs> you know, like um, the typical age for retirement is like 62 to 65. But, you know, I started as a biochemist. I did 10 years of biochemistry. Then I did 10 years of education research and game design. And I just started being a professor at age um, 48. So I, I'm not going to slow down. I'm going to be being a professor. I'm writing grants to make simulations of chemistry games. Um, you know, how, to, how does chemistry work instead of uh, just letting it be intuitive. So I'm, I'm having a lot of fun being a professor. And um, uh, you have to work really hard, but you get to do what you want as long as you work really hard. <laughs> so I think that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to... I want to start a, a science communication club too. So I want to, I want to get scientists to come out to bars or clubs, you know, like in the neighborhoods, and um, and then let everybody ask them questions. Well, I'll tell you what. My game teaches graduate level molecular cell biology. So you know, in immune defense, you put a receptor on a white blood cell. And that white blood cell does a different thing. And um, 
you don't learn that kind of stuff until you get to, you know, college level, graduate school kind of biology. But because it's a game and because it's trial and error and you just play it until you make it work, you know, it works for seventh graders. I have data showing you that seventh graders learn what receptors do on cells by playing a game. So it's very flexible who can play this game. Six-year-olds love it. I mean, it's a fun little game. Video games are complicated. You know, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, playing Legend of Zelda is an ordeal. You learn a lot of stuff. How to kill a deco shrub. You know, I mean, that's not... Immun immunology is not any more complicated than killing deco shrubs. I was going to say, the thing about biology is that the vocabulary is missing. The fundamental concepts. We didn't learn them in grade school. And, and most of our teachers in grade school, you know, they finished college before a lot of molecular biology was, was being done. So like stuff, molecular cell biology advanced in the 80s and the 90s very quickly. So, so using mRNA to make a vaccine, your high school teachers don't know about that. Yeah. And it's, it's because the science is going crazy. Molecular science is going super fast. So games are very good at teaching you fundamental concepts. Like this is, this is a, the scale of things. And, and this, this thing will do these different things. Like these tools will do these activities. And the games are really good for that.